Okay, hi. Um, I'm Barbara, <laughs> Barbara Davis, uh, Lincoln County Community Rights, and in full support of the people in Beaver Creek and Seal Rock. Uh, stop the spray. Um, I'm here to talk about, to introduce David Tevay <laughs> and Michelle Holman. Uh, David has a bachelor's degree in resource conservation and forestry and has been active in forest issues since the 1970s. He joined in starting the community rights group Freedom from Aerial Herbicides Alliance in Lane County, and he has been active in fighting aerial herbicide spraying in Oregon since that time. Close enough, John? Yeah, so you don't have to. All right. Okay. It was a bit awkward. Uh, Michelle Holman has lived in Western Lane County's Coast Range in Deadwood for more than 30 years and has been active in the anti-herbicide struggle since the late 1970s. After many years of her community's unsuccessful fight to stop government-protected aerial spraying of toxic chemicals by private, private logging companies, she renounced the traditional activism and joined the community rights movement. She's a founder of Community Rights Lane County and the Oregon Community Rights Network. She has served on the Mapleton School Board for 25 years. 35. 35 years, I stand corrected. And where more than 20 years ago, maybe more than that now, they, the school district stopped using toxic chemicals on school grounds, I would imagine attributed to Michelle Holman. Please welcome David and Michelle. from a well or surface water rather than the city. Okay. And have you, have you heard of any wells or surface water that people depend on, on the, in the coast going dry in late summer? Any? Yeah, please speak up, Deb. Yeah, um, um, I live on a ridge that's above the LC River Basin, and my well is the only one that hasn't gone dry on that ridge. Okay. Yeah, and other stories? Um, I'm on a spray in Beaver Creek, and uh, my mom's was dry every year. And I, was, my, uh, I switched it, and now I have a different situation with an above ground kind of pond to catch it in for now, and it doesn't have not gone dry yet, but really close. Yeah. I think my dad's shallow well goes dry as well, actually. Yeah. About 30 foot well. <laughs> Where am I at sea level? Okay. Yeah. And I think I saw one other hand. Uh, my hand was up, but I have a spring on Upper Drift Creek, and we haven't, there's no other wells around us. No neighbors. Yeah. And does it go dry? No. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, water has actually, you know, that it's happening on the coast. Um, there are wells all over Western Oregon that are that go dry now, and they didn't used to. Um, part of that can be from adding more pressure on them, more people, uh, you know, taking water, withdrawing water, more people living on the land. But uh, part of it is very much our um, forest land practices and logging. And uh, um, numerous studies have shown that uh, the water flow in later summer decreases <laughs> uh, we, tr we tried shutting it off, but that didn't work. Um, okay. So, uh, there's a uh, We've heard of them going dry near Fern Ridge Reservoir and uh, in, uh, real close to the reservoir even and, and uh, up on a ridge. Uh, numerous towns like uh, probably more likely to hear it around Bend or Roseburg in Southern Oregon, but um, it's, it's uh, happening in places you wouldn't expect, including 
in, as you said, the Oregon coast. Uh, so logging significantly reduces water flow in later summer, and the amount of organic matter in tree, tree bowls laying down in the land and that kind of thing really make a difference. Um, Dee and I, my spouse here, uh, we were doing trail work uh, outside of the mid middle Santa Ann wilderness uh, near Sweet Home, and it's a old growth forest. It was outside the wilderness, um, so we could use a chainsaw to get through a log that was down across the trail. We're just clearing the trail so hikers could go through. This was like a four foot wide log, so really, really uh, huge, and um, cut through it, and it was like immediately turning on a water spigot, full blast. And I thought it would go for maybe, oh, 20 seconds. It went on for several minutes. There was that much water in that log. And this was on a steep slope, but when, when big trees fall, they, they fracture and get cavities and then they can store water and they slowly release water during, you know, through, through the summer and that's a part of, and all that organic, different organic matter in the uh, soils and in, the, in the, the, the down logs and so forth keep water flowing in those healthy older forests and mature forests. And you might have all seen uh, a TV ad by the timber industry, it was a few years back, these two men drinking glasses of water in front of a, a, an intact forest stream, nice looking stream and everything, and they're proclaiming how forests um, give us clean water, but it certainly isn't their water. <laughs> With the water that they produce with their clear cuts and yeah. so forth. Um, so with uh, that tangent, um, I want to go into, um, we've lived in Lane County in Eugene area outskirts since uh, 86, but we started searching for rural land uh, to buy for farming, organic farming and, and gardening in uh, like 2011 and we quickly registered there was virtually no place in Lane County we could get away from aerial drift and uh, we have been aware of it before but so many people move into Oregon into rural areas and aren't aware of, of it as an issue until they find out um, too late but uh, there were there were just a few little areas where we could find that uh, that we figured it'd be miles uh, away from drift, and you can still get drift. Eugene even gets drift, but it's, it's way diluted. Um, so I thought I'd go into a little bit about uh, forest land ownership. Uh, there, a lot of people don't know that much about the different uh, land ownerships in forest land, and I think it's worth touching on because it really relates to to what laws apply. And for the most part, outside of federal land, um, on forest land, um, aerial, aerial and ground spray are both allowed. Uh, so federal land, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and National Park Service. Um, there's very little Bureau of Land Management in, in Lincoln County, but there's a lot of Forest Service. Sayusla so so National Forest is 169,344 acres in, in um, Lincoln County, and there's more Sayusla National Forest elsewhere. And uh, uh, there's also uh, state forest land, counties, and sometimes towns can, can uh, own forest land. Ideally, a town will own their own watershed forest land and can protect it. Um, but uh, state forest land, they regularly do aerial spraying. Um, county depends. Uh, for private, there's small woodlot owners, and they fairly frequently will go with aerial herbicide spraying when 
if they know of a larger timber operation spray for industrial forest land, they uh, will will tie in with that so they can save money and they'll they'll do aerial spraying because ultimately it's cheaper. And an awful lot of this gets down to the bottom line and profit. Um, uh, land trusts, um, a lot of people don't know that the land trusts like Nature Conservancy regularly do spraying. And there's, there's a focus on on uh, getting rid of invasives and, and non-native species. And it can take such a, be such a strong focus that they seem to lose sight of, of uh, you're doing more harm than good in a lot of cases with, with uh, trying to get rid of those. There's a local land trust. When we, we were looking for land um, outside of Eugene, uh, there's a local land trust that, that's uh, held in pretty high esteem in, in the area, and they say river, river habitat. And we were looking to buy land jointly with them, and then they take the river zones and we get the farmland. And we, we asked them directly, you know, do you spray? Oh, yes. And, and it, it was so absurd, it actually got to the thing of, um, we can't have our supporters seeing these weeds everywhere. You know, it's just like, uh, um, so it, it, it uh, um, and, and there, they had a, a test garden that was right next to a River Zone. And a friend of ours was running that for them and she was telling us about, they weren't even using integrated pest management and trying to minimize sprays. It was like haphazard spraying. And they're, they're trying to save endangered species and so forth, but like, what do these sprays, what effect do they have on, on the species of fish? Um, so anyway, uh, with uh, timber companies, things have changed a lot since the old days of vertically integrated uh, timber companies like Weyerhaeuser, um, they would own from the log trucks, the land, the log trucks, all the way through the mill and, and the finished products, wood products. And they've gone to uh, REIT, which is a real estate investment trust. And when it has to do with trees, then you can get nicknamed TREAT. <laughs> T-R-E-I-T-S. And uh, Weyerhaeuser owns 108,085 acres in Lincoln County. So, you know, it's like two thirds of Sayusla National Forest. Um, another type of Wall Street thing, and these are based on taxation and, and favorable tax status. So they've changed because of changes in the tax law and they're avoiding taxes. And by the way, the timber industry has been able to avoid, as since the 1970s, has gotten the Oregon legislature to change tax laws towards them, severance tax and so forth, and they pay a fraction of what they do in other states. Like Weyerhaeuser is doing fine up in Washington, and they pay way more taxes there. And it's, it's hit the counties. Um, and for, let's see, the PIMOs, the Timber Investment Management Organization is the other main category of kind of Wall Street uh, maneuvers for avoiding taxes. And Hancock uh, is uh, the largest is a very large one, and it is the biggest in Lincoln County of, of that type of thing. So you have Weyerhaeuser, yeah. <laughs> you have Weyerhaeuser as a, a, a treat, and Hancock as a Timo. And uh, what Timos are is you'll get a company that that takes on uh, managing land for large investors. 
and uh, so large in institutional investors and super wealthy people that can afford it, they will manage, they will, the investors will buy the land, but they will manage it for them. And all these, all these companies and REITs and TMOs uh, manage with industrial forest practices. So clear cut, spraying, the whole works. And uh, so Lincoln County has a total of 627,200 acres is my calculation. I did that indirectly. Um, and Sayus Law has essentially 170,000 of that. Weyerhaeuser has 108,000. Uh, Hancock has 100,000. So right there, Weyerhaeuser and Hancock have more forest land than, than Sayusla National Forest. And then you have other ones like Starker Forest uh, at 16,000, Miami Corporation at 11,000, Campbell Global at 7,500. An interesting thing with Campbell Global, they just recently got acquired by uh, uh, J.P. Morgan. And J.P. Morgan is doing a whole greenwash thing with ESG and, uh, and portraying it. If you get the chance up the Mackenzie River, take a drive up Quartz Creek. That's Campbell Global land. It is, of course, the, the Holiday Farm Fire. They did so much salvage logging. Um, and it's just really devastating. Um, so there are two two primary laws that protect aerial spraying and, and, and uh, other applications. Oregon Forest Practices Act, which has a free to grow provision that basically by the fifth year, tree, the, the trees have to be free from impediment. And so that prompts really fast uh, um, moving along for, for uh, getting the next crop growing. And, uh, and then the Farm and Forest Practice Act, which is known more generally as right to farm and forest law. And that actually specifically gives protection to, to timber companies for, for being able to aerially spray. It's, a, it's considered a commonly accepted practice and it protects anything that is considered that by farmers and forest, forest operators. And the two together kind of go hand in hand. And then you tie in the Wall Street money interest where you get uh, these, they're trying to turn over as fast a profit as possible. And you can actually, if you do, eat, eat, you know, well, we can talk a little bit about clear cutting, but you can do clear cuts at 80 years rather than the typical 35 to 40 years. You get actually a larger volume than if you did two 40 year cuts. And you have higher quality wood, you have more carbon sequestration, you have more, way um, more valuable forest to wildlife, to water, everything. Um, but because of the money pressures with Wall Street and investor profits, it pushes it to these short rotations. And they, they, want, they want the short rotations uh, for that. Um, and by the way, with clear cutting is the, you know, they can produce the most volume and make the most profits. And it, you don't actually have to aerially spray or even ground spray with clear cuts, but it's more economical. If you do other methods, it takes more people on the ground and it costs them more money, so they don't want to do it. And there actually seems to be a little bit of a cult effect going on with their thinking. Um, some of you might have met Roy Keane. Um, he's a, a old time forester uh, from the valley and he would talk about this too, and I, I've seen it myself. Um, it's like they want to purify the land after they've logged and make it totally under their control. And 
Roseburg Forest Products uh, owns a lot of land in Douglas County in checkerboard and BLM land, and they actually burn down the mineral soil besides spring. It's it, it's like <laughs> it, it, it's pretty pretty horrendous. Um, so the things that that crop aerial spraying and backpack spraying are free to grow the free to grow law, and uh, of course the the incentive for investor profits and faster profits. The state legislature is pretty much captured and indoctrinated by by the timber industry and uh, um, a lot of them seem to actually buy into the narrative believe it but then a number are you know get the timber industry has all this money from their prior wealth and then they've gotten rid of so many other taxes so our loss of taxes actually goes to their propaganda and their their pushing the legislature to to uh, do their bidding. And uh, one of the things, I don't know the details exactly, I, I, I wanted to delve into um, taxation, timber taxes more, but uh, trees are considered crops in Oregon and that actually gives them uh, uh, a different tax status that's way lower. Um, and uh, one of the things um, some of you are probably familiar with uh, um, the Memorandum of Understanding and the Private Forest Accord, and uh, they were that's a uh, thirteen environmental groups, and it, it was thirteen timber groups, and now it's down to eleven. Uh, made an agreement for the Private Forest Accord, and it basically is where. They're trying to meet the, the EPA's criteria for, for fish because Oregon got dinged for doing so much harm to fish because of their, their bad timber practices. And so um, a number of environmental groups uh, basically went along with this and they can't, they can't even take on aerial spraying now till 2027 with this agreement. So it, a lot of us feel like they sold us out, threw us under the bus. And uh, uh, Oregon Wild is uh, one of the main uh, groups there. We, we worked with Oregon Wild uh, quite a bit before. And I knew Sean Stevens, the executive director. I talked to him twice about this. You know, trying to pry, pry um, some information out of him. And, uh, he basically said in negotiations with the timber industry, the aerial spray thing seemed to be the almost like the most sacred or the thing that they would least negotiate on. So they got these minor changes with it um, day before notification, but then the the uh, the penalties for intervening with uh, a spray operation are way higher now. And, you know, so they're they're wanting to protect their spray operations. Um, I think I've gone on <laughs> a long time. I, I was going to touch on very briefly on on our aerial spray initiative, our charter amendment in Lane County. Um, we started that probably 2013, and that was initially just involved with that as an offshoot of Community Rights Lane County. And just to show you the, the flukiness of of the legal system in Lincoln County, you had a uh, a more complex and you could say radical initiative than ours. It took on Lincoln County took on aerial pesticide spraying, all that, and then you could, you could it basically uh, initially uh, supported uh, um, active intervention. If, if laws were broken. Um, in Lane County, we just did herbicide, aerial herbicide ban. Well, the judge in Lane County said it was too complicated. We had to divide it into two, and so we had to collect double the signatures. And they caught us on it, so we had to collect like 
30,000 signatures. Huh. And, and uh, the, the, um, they basically got us on a technicality at, that had never been tried before. We were a chart amendment, so we were trying to protect it from our county commissioners, who at the time were pretty much in the hands of the timber industry. And so we did a chart amendment, so it would be in the county charter, and they couldn't mess with it. And, but because it was that, a county charter, um, they pulled out some law, obscure law that had only been applied on the state level, and they, they pinned it on our initiative, and the course went with it. So that's how we didn't even get to a vote. But anyway, um, the, all this leads to Michelle, who um, in our current initiative, uh, that uh, is a rights of nature initiative and watershed, so it's, it, it very much deals with aerial herbicide spraying, but it's much broader because it's all the land and it includes other toxic uh, things to our watersheds. <clears throat> And thanks, Barb, for the introduction. Uh, clearly, my bio is a little dated. Um, I've lived in the Coast Range for 47 years, <clears throat> in Deadwood specific. And when I moved, first moved there, um, you know, we thought we had found Nirvana, and we were blissed out with all our wide open spaces. And we found out the dirty little secret that there were poisonings occurring. So from that, <clears throat> that point, excuse me, at that point, we started doing all the things that a good activist does. And I'm schooled in the fine art of challenging the BS because I'm a Vietnam baby. I was at the U of O during some pretty hot times and um, worked with some very dedicated people who inspired me and still do to this day. But we were writing letters to the corporations. We invited the corporate heads to come to our Deadwood Community Center and talk to us. We ended up protesting at corporate heads at headquarters. We went to the legislature. We wrote letters to our elected officials. We were trying to behave and, and engage, and it got very clear that this was a waste of our time, and they always told us straight up, it's legal. What we're doing is legal. This is well-settled law. And we have to realize at a certain point, and clearly you all have gotten the memo, that just <clears throat> because it's legal doesn't mean it's just. So that's our job, is to um, challenge what we see as a government that doesn't really do its job. We, yeah, we have the EPA, happy freaking new year. What is that doing for us, right? right. Oh, the government's <laughs> taking care of your water. There's the, the, um, uh, the Water Quality Act that is supposed to have, I mean, after how many years? Supposed to have elevated the importance of clean water and it really has done none of that. It has only protected and legislated how much harm we can endure. We, the people that live here, the animals, the ecosystem, the plants. It's criminal to have a, a government that says they're taking care of you, but really what they're doing is they're taking care of the corporate yeah, situation. <clears throat> no, this is all no secret. And, you know, just hearing David talk about free to grow or the right to farm and forest. You know, the way they sanitize the, top, the, the labels of these organizations that are really only about corporate profit. That's, it's so manipulative. And yeah, many of our neighbors buy that, buy those lines, um, and many of us see right through. It's very transparent. So there's a lot on us, those of us in this room who have a conscious a conscience and a consciousness to battle what we see is our most sacred trust, and that's the Mother Earth herself. All of us have kids, we know kids, grandkids are coming, we owe it to them. We also owe it to the, our ancestors who did the work for us so that we can enjoy what we enjoy in these times, many of whom never saw the fruits of their labor. 
and I'm not delusional. I'm not really expecting to see the world that I envision, that I work for, but I am hell-bent on being a foot soldier in the fight, and that's, that's what I see here. So you people inspire me. I mean, I'm grateful to know that these little brush fires are happening. They're happening everywhere. They're happening globally. So um, we're just doing our little part right here. You can't unsee what you see. You can't unknow what you know. You're never going back. And this is a tireless job. I, you know, I can't. I wish I could give you the good news. Next week we'll be all sitting on the beach, drinking a beer and not talking about this. Very unlikely, you know. So, pace yourselves. Dig in. It's hard, but you are. I mean, you are doing the righteous work. I cannot tell you how. Uh, uplifted I am to be in a community space where people are acknowledging the role that you play. Um, so yeah, we, we got hammered with our spray ban. We never got to get to the ballot. We took it as far as the Oregon Supreme Court, who did not surprisingly side with, with the corporate boys. We knew that was what was happening. And we know that's what's happening now. That does not mean we stop fighting. I mean, you know, it took women and, and men a hundred and some years to get the right to vote, you know, and people told them they were nuts and it's illegal and you women just go back to, you know, your Betty Crockerville, you know, no, N-O, and today we get to vote and one day I'll get to vote for someone I like. That has never happened. <laughs> But, um, you know, we just have to build upon it, and you have to have the long view. And it is frustrating because the earth herself is saying, oh, we don't really have that much time. Get off your fat rear ends and let's move. But it's a, just a long slog up a tall mountain. And just take your place. This is your time in history. You're doing it. So bless up all of us doing it. Um, the Lane County Watershed's Bill of Rights is our next attempt at protecting our waterways. And that's what we were trying to do with the spray ban. And I love that you've taken the positive, protect Oregon watersheds. As you can see, we have our bumper stickers, protect our watersheds, protect Lake County watersheds.org. Um, yeah, let's, let's try another kind of manipulative tack to get people to understand that we're gonna do something positive. We love where we live. It's up to us to take care of it, so we're going to protect it. And with that, I just want to read our preamble, because this is some elegant writing, and I'm super proud of all the stellar humans in our <coughs> crew that wrote this. Um, but this is just going to give you a vibe. And we have them back there. Um, we are actually inviting you to replicate. We do not own this. We want this to grow. So if this sounds like something, it could possibly be uh, one of your tax, and I will say one. I mean, changing unjust law is critical and long. And so there are other things that have to happen simultaneously. You may find yourself doing things that you didn't think you would even consider doing. You're protesting, you may be dialing that up, who the hell knows. I mean, we're all trying, we're actually throwing spaghetti at the wall because we don't have all the answers. We just know we have the fervor in our guts. So, you know, we are, we want to hear if people have other ideas. This is one of them. So we are about challenging and exposing unjust law and replacing it with just law. So this is the Lane County Watersheds Bill of Rights. We, the residents of Lane County, understand that all water within the state from all sources of water supply belongs to the public, as stated in the ORS. Uh, 537110, even where it flows over private land. And we believe access to clean water is a natural right of humans and all other species. In securing the health of the watersheds of Lane County, we acknowledge that watersheds are living systems and possess the inherent right to exist, flourish, regenerate, and naturally evolve for their own sake, interdependent with and independent of human needs. Lane County watersheds are essential and vital ecosystems for a healthy environment. Our watersheds include the water and land area that drains rain and snow into rivers, creeks, lakes, wetlands, aquifers, and the Pacific Ocean, within which all living things are inextricably linked. 
we acknowledge that the first peoples connected to these watersheds established and practiced a relationship of care and respect and a deep sense of responsibility to ensure the health and vitality of the watersheds. A healthy watershed conserves water, promotes stream flow, supports sustainable creeks, rivers, lakes, and groundwater sources, creates healthy soil, and provides habitat for wildlife and plants. A healthy watershed provides safe drinking water and food and enables adaptation of living species to the adverse impacts of climate change by cooling the air and absorbing greenhouse gas emissions. Due to the ever con ever increasing contamination and demands on our watersheds, we, the citizens of Lane County, declare our responsibilities as defenders of these ecosystems to ensure their highest legal protection from degradation, loss of ecological balance, and all threats to their health and well-being. Government has failed in its responsibility to the public by enacting laws that tolerate or permit the incremental degradation of watersheds and water quality. We assert that in order to protect our water and watersheds, we must, sh we must shift governance away from policies that allow voluntary compliance or directly permit pollution by entities who view nature only as lifeless property and thereby merely regulate the degree of allowable harm to be inflicted on watersheds. Pursuant to the right of self-government, as stated in the United States Declaration of Independence and protected by the Oregon State Constitution, if government repeatedly violates our rights, we, the citizens of Lane County, have the right and responsibility to alter or replace that system with one that secures and protects our rights. It has become necessary that we reclaim, reaffirm, and assert our inalienable rights and extend protections that provide legal standing and rights recognition to all watersheds in Lane County in order to ensure that they are no longer subordinated as property subject to harmful actions by unaccountable political and corporate entities. Therefore, we, the citizens of Lane County, enact the Lane County Watersheds Bill of Rights, which establishes irrevocable rights for all our watersheds to exist, flourish, regenerate, and naturally evolve, free from contamination and degradation, and which thereby protects their integrity and natural diversity, both now and for future generations. Here, here. <laughs> So this, this law, that's just the preamble. That's just the flowery language that tells us our hearts, it speaks to our hearts. You know, we do this work because we love each other and we love the Mother Earth. That's the founding principles of a community right movement. And yes, it's up to us to challenge the laws that are life killing, honestly. So it's one tact, if you're interested, um, I really invite you to, well, you can talk to Deb and, and um, Barb. They're both seasoned veterans of what it is to challenge core law. Um, we're available. Lane County Community, community Rights Lane County members are available to come and talk. If you have other venues, churches, it, you know, we will talk to anybody because we believe in this. And we are all volunteers and we don't get one penny. And I mean, you know, this is just this is just principled living. It's nice, it, you know. That's that's a joy and an honor to tell you the truth. I mean, you know it because you're clearly doing some of this. <clears throat> we have a community rights action meeting once a month. It's a public meeting. Uh, it's on Zoom still. We start we started doing that in uh, during the COVID um, years. But um, our steering committee meets has met every every week since 2012. Oh, so we're wow. very dedicated. And um, I mean, if you're looking to the side or somewhere for help, you're not going to find it. It's you. So you know, I mean, I think that is that's kind of the invitation that that um, I'm giving to you is to accept your sisters and cousins and brothers in Lane County as resources. We're here, we want to share this information. This is not just about protecting us, we want to protect the globe. We're just, we're just a, a little part of it, but in this, in the, if you could imagine 
a patchwork quilt. We're all little quilts in the various places. And one day, maybe we can stitch together a blanket that is really something that we can be proud of and that's going to protect our, our Mother Earth and ourselves. So I guess um, thank you for having us here. And we're wel welcoming questions. If you have questions, we can move into the Q&A. about the bread basket in, um, in the U.S. where the soil is literally dead and the food that is grown there has very little nutrition. I mean, we are, we are the one species that's really hell-bent on our own destruction. We can't figure this out except the profit is really a motivator. That should be illegal as well. So, you know, what they're doing in our forests here, it's... Um, you just have to put on blinders and look at your checkbook and see that you've got a nice stash in there. But that's, you're 100% correct. And it's not a forest. When they call it a forest, that's when I go yeah. to this. Yeah. This is a tree, tree farm. farm. It's a plantation. A healthy forest has multiple species and a, and a you know, a healthy, a healthy canopy and everything that's underneath the mycelium. Do you want to speak to this? I covered it well. All right. <laughs> yeah. I'd just like to add that it's, it's really reminiscent of Vietnam and the use of Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. I was there, uh, it was horrific, and the results of that are documented, yet it's still allowed. It's ridiculous that that is the lesson that is a hard lesson that hasn't been learned by all society. True enough. Yeah. I mean, and then we, like when we banned DDT in this country and then we were shipping it to Mexico and it's coming back on the food, back right into our tables. Was, you know, we have not humbled ourselves. Yeah, it might be quick. You know, pay me now, pay me later. And I, I don't want to pay that price. I don't want my kids to pay that price. We have a lot of cancer is, uh, is like just accepted. Well, you know, we'll fix cancer. I mean, they'll give us cancer, and then they're going to give us a chemical to kill cancer, and they're going to make money any way they can. Yeah. Also, the veterans who uh, were in Nam, the government said, you're not sick. You know, 240 is not going to hurt you. And they had to fight, fight, and fight like hell mm -hmm. to get something mm -hmm. to, uh, to mostly take care of this. But it's bullshit. You know, I'm sometimes I'm really embarrassed about being a human. Uh, because, I mean, what have we done for the, uh, the planet? I mean, uh, every other species is valuable, but we don't seem to do anything to better the world. We just keep it. That was a nice thing about the pandemic. Because the air cleaned up, uh, I would watch. Uh, like Yosemite National Park was closed. And it was great to see the camps. You'd see the bear, fox, and whatever roaming where they used to be. This is before we, and you know, so yeah, that's just my little spiel, sorry. But um, yeah, it's really sad. So um, if I seem embarrassed, I, I am. So I know it's been said that we are the most invasive species. That's right. <laughs> we are. We are. Yeah, we are. And it, you know, yeah, it's, um, it's a, uh, a challenge uh, to to find it within yourself to not give up, but we cannot give up. I mean, we just know what we know. We have to continue to think about the generations that are coming, and they're looking at us. You know, like I've I've had a lot of friends my age. You know, I can see my age in this room <laughs> who say I'm done. I gave at the office, and I'm like, you know, Never we helped mess it up. You know, yeah, we want to pass the baton on, but we're not done. It's still upon us to, you know, to be active, inspiring, and also learning from the youth because there's a lot of great information coming from young kids that are fighters. And um, so, yeah, I think that 
It's, it is uh, embarrassing and um, cringeworthy frequently, the behaviors that the people are dis displaying, and that, and that we are still in this old paradigm of corporate profits. You know, this is a really, this is a, a little community rights blur, but corporations, when corporations were first chartered in the very beginning of this country, in the 1700s, Corporations were chartered for a particular specific purpose, for a particular specific time, and that purpose had to benefit the community. That has just been flipped. Mm -hmm. You know, now, now you have corporate lobbyists writing laws, government um, enforces laws, and you and I are relegated to the status of consumer. That's our job buy their stuff, uh, you know, buy their line. Don't worry about 245T or 24D. The government has approved it for use. You are alarmists. Just go about your business. We got you here. And those of us who question that kind of crazy rationale, we're the true patriots. I agree with everything you're saying, especially the part about uh, the corporate world sort of leading, leading us all in, in down a very dark road, and it's very concerning to me. I just want to clarify something because, you know, I, I'm probably not knowledgeable about a lot of these things. I've been listening to... Uh, everything from the Forest Service my whole life. So, you know, seems smart. Yeah, so I, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to really understand everything. Uh, there was one thing you said about burning down to mineral soil and fires. Fires are actually part a natural occurrence, which is very good for our soils because it adds nutrients to it and also the temperatures also make it possible for some plants to grow. Mm -hmm. So they need the they need that intensity, and the Native Americans used it a lot, um, and they but they rotated it, and they allowed the soil to to grow back again, and and that's a benefit actually of clear cuts as long as they don't poison it with poisons. Is that a, you, I I don't support clear cuts, but that is kind of a thing that happens is that then you have all these other plants that start growing unless the the, the timber companies kill all the plants too. All of the other hardwoods and grasses and everything that starts growing after they clear cut. Now if they allow that stuff to grow, then you've got habitat for deer and elk and you know all of these animals that need that. And they don't have it if you just if you have an old growth forest, there's no there's no plants for animals, right? They can't. No, no, that's, that's not true. But I'm going to hand this to Dave. Yeah. I do want to say when you say natives used to, but the natives still do. <laughs> Sorry. <We're> right here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the Roseburg Forest products are burning their clear cuts. They burn them down to mineral soil. Yeah. And that is very different than, than uh, most fires. Most fires uh, burn in a mosaic, and there'll be some areas of more severe. They're just a, it, it, it gets super complicated because we've changed forest ecosystems so much. And indigenous people did control burns. A lot of those too were in a time uh, when there were way more beaver ponds and way more water in the whole system that provided a natural break. So you'd, you'd get smaller burns and, and so forth. Um, another aspect of our essential deforestation we're doing is we're basically creating a situation of less rain, less precipitation. Um, one of our founding members had a great bumper sticker, big trees cause rain. And they do, and, and they give off um, molecules into the air that are condensation attractants to, to, to bring rain. And part of the cycle we're getting of droughts and, and, uh, and then flooding, too much rain at times, 
is tied in with how we mess up the water cycle with all our logging and, and removal of, of, of matter. But as, you know, as far as the wildfire thing goes, um, there is a lot of myths about wildfires. And uh, that could easily be a whole session in itself. Right. Um, and the timber industry has their own version of it. They want to log big trees. And the, so they're proposing logging out there um, far away from communities. Um, yeah. but. I can say making changes within um, BLM and the Forest Service um, on the, the other side of it, um, not the timber industry, but the other side of it. There's just an imbalance there. Mm -hmm. right? You know, you, you want to be able to uh, have equal say at the table when you're representing environmentalists and environmental concerns and watershed. There's an imbalance. Timber companies have more power over our actual government agencies. Yeah. And that's that's where I'm really concerned. That, that they don't belong in there. It's like, no, they, yeah. we're a government organization, Forest <laughs> Service and BLM. That means we work for the people. And they're not doing that. No. So yeah. that's where I, you know I'm coming in. But they're try there's a lot of people on in, the, in the Forest Service that are trying really hard. Mm -hmm. You know, there are wildlife biologists, there are biologists, there, you know, and they and fish and wildlife people are working it. But they're within the confines of these organizations, and so I don't know how how to um, to balance that out to get more on this side. So that's that's what what I'm trying to get involved in here. Yeah, one, one thing briefly with the collaborations you might have heard of, there's a lot of collaborations uh, in different places between um, so-called environmental groups and the timber industry and it's for creating jobs and so forth. But what they'll often do is pick, cherry pick the environmental group that's willing to basically sell out. So the Oregon Wild was doing a, a lot of collaborations, and they backed way out of them because of that factor, and and it's just a lot of pressure to go along, and you know create a false consensus about oh this, we're all in this together, and this, yeah. and exclude people who don't agree. Kind of my bottom line is, as Maya Angelou said, when you know better, you do better. <laughs> and it's, you know, it takes it back to what should actually be. And that almighty dollar should be extracted from it. You know, I can't imagine that any person, I mean, it's hard for me to grasp, would want their family to be impacted by spray, by uh, food that was contaminated. It just blows my mind. It's like, yeah. where, where's your brain? Where's oh, your well, brain? Well, part of that my is wallet. that yeah. Yeah. I don't care about the little people. That's some, of the, some of the real um, insensitivity to the people who suffer from all this behavior is that most of these corporations or the corporate heads who do their fuckery in our communities, um, you know, they don't live here. They don't live in our community. They're living over there and they're, I mean, not the, it's a closed system. It's one globe and they're going to get theirs, but they don't get it like we get it. And so this is why, um, from a community rights standpoint, we ask the question, why should corporate privilege extend why should they be allowed to do harmful activity in our communities why do they have more right to do that than we have the right to protect ourselves why are that there food deserts why yeah well there's greed and there's we could this is a whole this is cr community rights 101 and we could definitely go down that rabbit hole and i love to because it's the foundational premise for doing this kind of work because spray is only one problem I mean, we've got a multitude of corporate, the corporate governmental bedroom where they're doing their thing to one another and enjoying the hell out of themselves, and we are the people that suffer from this. So that that's 
because the spray is one thing. And, you know, it, I mean, grassroots, it's right here in your community. This is your issue. So, yeah, take it and then expound upon it because, really, it's systemic. It's, there is this floor of corporate privilege that has been legalized since the dawning of this nation. And it was, a, it was always supposed to be so. They never gave a, a rat's ass about us. Yeah, yeah. Two other factors just to name and have them in this discussion. One is that these agencies that are supposedly working for biology and, yeah. and life, and I know that there are human beings there who have good ethics yeah. and, and there are coming yeah. from here. But they their agencies are not well supported with money, well, operational funds. So they, they cut for us when they're supposed to be protecting for us because they need the money to pay payroll. I mean, it's that kind of bullshit. Yeah. The other part of it is is the very specific use of misinformation, disinformation, and intimidation. Katie, Katie, what the hell is her last name? Katie Murray. Murray. Oh. It has another News Times goodie. And her, her yeah. word count is 600. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder how she manages to do 600 uh, words in that paper when all of us get to get 250. Uh, uh, that's one piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Times two, she did it before. Yeah. 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 But, but Carol did a deep dive into her stuff. And she sent me quotes from her previous work where she has been on the side of protecting forests and <laughs> calling out practices. We, I, we need to do something about that. But it, it's that it's that toleration of lies and misinformation that just makes me froth at the mouth. <laughs> and I'm not sure what to do with it. So to, to respond to that about the agency, so it actually was Al Gore, partly, who essentially destroyed the Forest Service, saying that, oh, we need to cut back, and then that would help the environmental movement. But actually, a lot of the people that they got rid of were the people on the environmental people. side. Uh, and so it's very frustrating. It was literally gut in the like late 90s, early 2000s. We lost so many people. In the, and it was very sad. A lot of people just lost their jobs or they had to move to Alaska or something. But there are people, very good people, in the Forest Service that are working really hard to balance that out. I just want to put that out, including my husband, who a wildlife biologist. Yeah, when, when I think with the federal agency, the BLM and the Forest Service, um, they basically get a lot of pressure from Congress to put out the cut. And, it, and no matter how many good people are down below, if they have leaders who are sold out and yeah. buying into that, it's hard for them to, and plus, Plus limited funds and funds being cut and all that. It's, well, it's hard. I have a bad, bad memory for all of the laws and stuff, but they do have protection laws. Um, the the federal ball? forest protection and, you know, there are laws that have been passed, legislation that has been passed for protections. And, but like you said, because there's an imbalance between the environmentalists and the forest service and the, uh, the timber companies, they can't, they, like, my husband's feet were always in the fire. Like, he's trying to make them comply. The, for, the timber companies comply with these laws that do exist for protection. And, and so it's really hard. Like, he's all his life, he's done, like, spotted owl surveys and all of that stuff to try to, um, to bring change in the, for, and it's just, it's just like, um, you know, sometimes I worry about his personal safety, <laughs> honestly. But so, because he is fighting the fight, and so there are a lot of people like that. But, but you know, he does. Um, I just want to recognize that that's that exists, and that uh, that if we start with what we have rather than in reinventing the wheel and saying, oh well, we need to you know, look at those people, you know, and and find out what it's like for them to try to make the timber companies follow the laws, the new laws for protection. Community rights work isn't for everyone. 
I mean, it just clearly isn't. And if your personal passion is to work with within the agencies, not and, anymore. No. Okay. Well, <laughs> so I mean, it's why we're in this room because we have yeah. we're tired of a system that just really was designed from day one to not take into consideration the things that we hold dear. Right. It's, it's, a, it's we like to say. It's not a broken system. It's rigged. It's fixed. And we need to break it. We need yeah. to break it. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, Deb? Or, 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 or. I know we look a lot like A lot. <laughs> Same person. <laughs> um, can you, to take a step back, can you address, I know that, that you said Community Rights Lane County has done all kinds of things to come back this from the beginning, just like what we're doing here, writing letters to our, con our, con our congressman, our legislator in Salem, our board of commissioners and all that. Um, Triangle Lake did something different. Can you talk about what they did in Triangle Lake? Because I think they addressed it with the EPA and got some lab work done on the residents there in Triangle Lake. Can you talk about that? Well, I can a little. I wish Erin was supposed to be here. She yeah, lives in Triangle Lake. But they did do, they did water testing and they also did blood testing. And they found, I mean, yes, there are chemicals and um, toxic chemicals herbicides in, in their urine um, and they took it to as far as they could take it we ended up having a really big meeting with agency people and um, environmentalists and just residents in the community and a, a lovely report was issued and I guarantee you it's on a shelf somewhere um, community rights Lane County never did any of that I did that before I before I defected from the traditional um, environmental kind of activism. But community rights, Lake County doesn't go to the legislature. I mean, we, we don't use that as a default. If it could work, and I know that there are, and I'm just speaking, really I should just speak for myself, I never go to Salem. I cannot tolerate standing uh, deferential to some guy who, uh, who I pay his wages for my taxes and he's not doing shit for me. So I'm not going there. But, um, you know, for if you want to do water testing, pre-sprays, if you want to do blood work, it's, it's information. And we can put you in touch with Aaron King and Justin in trying to like. But did it change anything in trying to lay or are they no longer getting sprayed? Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. Uh -uh. No. I mean, we've been, some of us have been doing this for 40 and 50 years and before. So, and we have vets here in this room who know what it, what it means to be harmed. You've lost your brothers and sisters from the, it, this, is, this is not new. This started a long time ago. And it is still legal. And as long as it's protected by law, it will continue. I mean, the, the Forest Service isn't spraying in, in the Deadwood watershed anymore, and I don't think it's just, they spray anywhere, the Forest Service. They don't aerial. They don't aerial spray, but they could easily do they could, they could be doing backpack. Spray. And you know, those of, those of us who find comfort in backpack spraying, oh, you are diluted. <laughs> diluted, yeah. not diluted. It is, it's, it's not as scary or, and heinous as aerial spraying, but it is wicked. It's toxic. That stuff's going into your groundwater. Yeah, Dee. So when Triangle Lake, my understanding when they got tested for atrazine in their blood and urine, the logging companies stopped spraying them to skew the results of the rest of the study. So oh, it really geez. nullified the study and nullified the yes. efforts because they can do that. Oh. Yeah. They have a cocktail. They have a, like a, a many, many, many kinds of poisons that they can use, and they don't have to reveal to us exactly what the what the pot potent potion is. It's other. It's yeah. other. And then there's the inner ingredients, which they really don't have to tell you about, and that's troubling in itself. I mean, better living through chemistry has brought us to this point in time. <laughs> Better profit. Better profit. Yes, more, more profits. That has not changed. Yeah. So, I first I want to thank you both for what you being here today and what you've been doing for years. <clears throat> I'm kind of in kindergarten about learning about all of this. So, my question 
might be naive. I appreciate that you are sharing your watershed um, initiative. Why are we not joining together? <laughs> well, you mean why aren't we doing um, a protect Oregon watersheds like over? So, when we had our initiative overturned, mm -hmm. this initiative, do you feel is different that it doesn't need to be statewide? That it couldn't get turned over under the same technicality that the Lincoln County one did? Most? That's no, no, no. Uh -uh. I, I don't. I, we don't think that at all. Uh -huh. we, but we know that we have to build capacity. We uh -huh. are looking to the state to give you a, a really kind of mile high view. There is, and you probably know about preemptive uh, law. The state says that no you children down here will do as we say. You cannot change law unless we give you that permission. We have already written a state uh, constitutional amendment that would say that we have the right to write and pass laws that protect our health, safety, and welfare. That's, that would annihilate preemption. We are a long ways from there. I mean, this is a nice full room, but you need about 5,000 more of these rooms. So we're, we are just trying to build capacity. COVID really kind of took us out of the knees. We were, all, we were in the building mode, and some of us were traveling around and talking to different communities. Um, we have to get critical mass because to, to get a state preemptive constitutional amendment on the ballot is hundreds of thousands of signatures to get it on the ballot. Six percent or something. It's, a, it's just a lot. So these little brush fires that happen in little communities, this is where our power lies, right here. I mean, I'd love to take it out at the Fed. And actually, we also have written a federal uh, preemptive law that would go into the federal constitution. We did this in Colorado about, I don't know, eight years ago, some of us met and we wrote the, I don't know what number it is, but it's an amendment to the constitution that would give us the right to write and pass laws that, that would help, that protect our health, weight, uh, safety and welfare. It'd be great if we were there, but we are not there yet. So to join forces, the way we join forces is you write a watershed protection law. We write one. They're going to do it over there in Hardy County, and then they're going to do it in Clackamas, and then they're going to do it in Multnomah. And pretty soon we have that protective blanket I'm talking about. And also we're building critical mass. And people are going to start talking about this stuff we already are talking about this. I mean, and the really fascinating thing, you know, where I live, we've got a whole, whole cadre of redneck relatives down there, good people, who are, are actually more in line with this way of thinking, because they're already pretty critical of government. So in some ways, you'll find that there's really strange alliances that are happening. You might not be able to talk about queer rights or uh, women's right to choose with, with your brethren down there, but you can talk about why should corporations have more power to do harm in our community than we have to protect ourselves from that harm? Yeah. It's, it's, it's growing. Yeah. I, I would appreciate it if we could take a piece of the, the enforcement in this, this measure and talk about like a, an example of if we found X happening in this watershed, how would we respond to that? How would this bill work for us? Mm -hmm. You want to pick that? Um, I mean, one thing that we've added to our to our initiative is um, like a precautionary principle. So you don't have to wait for the harm to happen. You know it's mm -hmm. coming, and you can hold up the red flag right here. And this is. If this thing passes, then your government, our government, our commu county commissioners are held responsible. If they're not stepping up quick enough or you don't like the way they're behaving, then any one of us can do it. So it gives, it gives the right of the individual who oftentimes has way more tenacity and spine than your elected officials um, to, to call bullshit. And, and take it to court. You got something? 
So the question it is done by court. It's yeah. still done in the courts, and as we know, there's no justice in the courts. Right. But but what we are trying to do is just elevate and educate how skewed this whole system is to the corporate money. You know, we don't expect that we're really going to just sail through. We may very well pass it, like you guys did, and we will get sued right away. And then there's the fight. That's the fight we want. You know, people need to see, I mean, what I think we, all of us, dropped the ball on Lincoln County. You know, that was a moment that could we could have just rallied, and somehow it took us out at the, at, at, I don't know what happened. I really don't know what the happened. The pandemic, but, really. It was, because it was in 2020. Oh, it, was like, it was 2019 we got overturned, and then came COVID okay. in 2020. Yeah. But so that, that kind those, of stopped these are, everything. These are moments where this should be a rallying cry. You know, yeah. hey, we've passed it, the people have spoken, and what you're going to tell us that our our vote doesn't matter? Ooh, <coughs> take to the streets. I mean, and, yeah. and really, it, yeah, you're right, it was COVID. But we may have another opportunity soon enough to be told that, yeah, you won, and it's too bad for you. Then we're going to be pissed. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Dee. No, no, go ahead. Um, one more thing. I know that our measure, as well as your watershed measure, includes giving legal rights to the natural world. Can you talk about that? How you would, and, and, the, and the history of globally, yeah. nature's rights. Yeah, so we speak for the voiceless. So if you harm that river, or you harm that forest, or you harm the ecosystem, then one of us is going to go to court and actually stand for that voiceless entity. So there's a book that was written, I think, in the, in the 70s about trees having standing. And like, then people are like, what? A tree is going to be protected in, in a court of law? Well, not, maybe not a tree, but a forest, yeah. A forest can be protected in a court of law, can have standing and have rights, inalienable rights, just like our inalienable <coughs> rights. And the, you know, the thing that I think really fuels a lot of us is that we are nature. People are nature. We, yeah. we think nature's outside of us. But we, if, when you consider yourself as a, a part and albeit a, a dangerous part, but we, you know, we are a part, then we think of nature in terms of a relative that needs to be protected. And in this cr stupid, crazy legal world that we all live in, we have to use that, that forum. And it's being done in Ecuador, it's being done in Australia, there are rivers with, with rights, inalienable rights, in uh, New Zealand, um, I mean, even in the United States. Craig, Craig, 340 laws globally. 340, 340 laws. 340 laws globally mm -hmm. that are giving, that are protecting, legally protecting nature. Right. right. That blew me away. Yeah. yeah. And in Ecuador, they actually put it in their constitution. So, and it's, I mean, and it's, the, and it's been for a challenge in Ecuador, and it's nature one. Yeah. And they had, they had to 70% vote yeah. by the people. 70%. Nature one. Well, we have a lot of those good laws too to protect wildlife and, and, and spotted owls and all this stuff. But they're just they're just compromising. They're just they're just not able to. Well, see, the problem is that the federal government won't step in if the state government is quote doing their job, <laughs> and so the federal government is looking at according to what's in place in Oregon, the state agencies of the state departments are unfortunately defined as doing their job. And yeah. so then all of these federal protections that you're talking about, we can't even access them. Yeah, that's wrong. One thing with uh, regulations and a community rights perspective on it is that they are essentially there to protect the corporations. Yes. The initial regulations uh, that were started by the federal government were at the request of a railroad company and in the 1870s, and basically through uh, chicanery, they got they got the idea of of uh, 
corporations uh, being persons, legal persons. And, and uh, anyway, the, the thing of cap regulations end up still being under this, under the Commerce Clause and the Contract Clause of our Constitution, which basically give money to interest the trump card or the a, a way of turning anything we try um, to change the system to their favor. And rights of nature recognizes that nature has rights, it's a counter to corporate rights. And over time, uh, corporations have gained more and more legal rights uh, through Supreme Court interpretations, some of them pretty far out, using the 14th Amendment uh, to, to give them more rights and so forth. And you know, the, the, the thing comes down to corporations have more legal rights than a local community and they can impose their will on local communities and we don't have any protection. And we're dependent on our state legislature and they're captured and so forth. And then, you know, people have been beating their heads against the wall at the le state legislature by Ariel Spring for decades and getting nowhere. And anyway. It's actually civil disobedience through lawmaking. That's, that's what this is, because, yeah, there is a law, it's out there, and we say that law needs to be tossed, and this one needs to be inserted. I think another contributing factor that yeah. everybody's up against here is the educational system. <laughs> uh, the educational system, the book written in the 70s called The Pesticide Conspiracy, and it highlights by, by a professor that the educational material and the funding that is given my interpretation is it displaces logic and common sense and what people would, would have compassion for. And my dealings with people in the Forest Service or loggers have been that way that they, they said, well, I've been to school and this is what they taught me. Yeah. And, it had, and they, so they have disenfranchised the environment and logical conclusions to things and just say, well, this, we have a right to do this. And so it seems like some emphasis has to be placed on changing the educational system at starting at an early age and the expression of college where people get their degrees in forestry or whatever, yeah. they go, oh, well, this is the way we have to do it. Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah. There are, you're 100% right. I mean, there's, it's got to start young. And like I said, the, here, this is one problem we have, aerial spraying. Our educational system has got some big holes in it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the higher ed, same thing. A lot of good people go to OSU and get, uh, you know, they go in there because they, they love the woods. And then they get the party line, yeah. you know, that's how they're educated. Mm -hmm. um, it, the, the thing that, why I love talking to people like you is because I see people who question. You know, you're, you're not just sold the bill of goods. You think, oh, something smells rotten here, and I'm, I'm gonna go to that meeting. But you, you know, that's not standard operating procedure for a lot of people. So what we do is we we talk to one another. We're done. I'm done talking to my elected officials. I'm talking to you. I'm going to talk to my neighbors. Wherever I go, if somebody will listen or someone has a question, I want to I want to I want to insert doubt, and and I want to eradicate. Um, we call it the black hole of doubt within ourselves that we can't do this work. Like, I don't know, it's too big, or I, if, maybe if we, you know, if we have more money, maybe we could do this. But we can do this. I mean, we just have to do this, you know. And we just have to keep spreading these yeah. little germs of of questioning because this this old model. Is a it's a it's a death model. Yeah. Um, I would like to say that the timber class at Walcourt High, the the um, teacher sent home information against um, aerial spray. Amen. Really? Amen. Yes. Wow. So that was pretty exciting. Yes. Some uh, sort of on the opposite end of that. That, that is great. 
um, the Oregon Forest Research Institute, OFRI. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. They, they are actually a taxpayer-funded timber propaganda machine. Part of the meager taxes the timber industry in Oregon pays go to fund that, which is to promote their version of forestry. And one of the it just numerous things they do to, to push their version of forest and forestry is they have all these ready-made packets for school teachers, grade school teachers to use. And you know, yeah. teachers are stressed. They like things that are easily used. And, and uh, so if any of you are involved with school systems in any way to give pushback against that stuff because that's how, you know, it's, it seems like the timber industry has won the propaganda war in Oregon and they dominate with it. And, but we have a chance to, to overthrow it. Things are changing. And uh, one of the things, I mean, there's downsides to a lot of people moving to this state, but people who are new to this state are more likely to go, that's really messed up. <laughs> that, and whereas, whereas the old school uh, Oregonians are like, oh, this is normal. Yeah. Well, my son, he's in the high school program, so a timber person said to my son, and so we're debating this, not that he really cares, he cares about football and girls, but um, we were discussing it, and he said, well, I heard that when, when they spray and it gets on the water, it evaporates. And it was <laughs> so, you know, they're, they're just getting a lot of misinformation. Yeah. And so it's, it's, you know, it's just so hard to keep up with all of the, um, that kind of thing that, that's just being circulated. All, like all the kids believe that about this spraying that they're doing. That, oh, it, you got it's your job. It's a, that's your job. <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, that's what we do. Right, right, right. But that's what we do. But that's what they were talking about. The, the propaganda has been really exacerbated by the pharmaceutical industry because we've got a very brainwash that whatever thing you have, the symptom you have, they have some cure for it. It's not a cure, and the side effects are worse than what you had. So, consequently, people use that same yeah. dislogic. Question, 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 question at all. Um, I think I think we're probably done here, but uh, be in touch with, with um, Deb and Barb about our community rights action. It's it's Zoom, so you okay, can tomorrow. this Monday night, right? It's tomorrow, tomorrow night. It's tomorrow night. And we're gonna be showing a couple of films about um, water and and just talk. I mean, it's really uplifting to be with people who think like we do, because when we get, leave the room, we have to interplay with other folks who don't think like us. So this is where we get inspired. This is where we get lifted up. And then we go out into the trenches, because we are warriors. That's what we are. So bless you all for coming here today. Thank you.